Welcome to St. Luke's Online Church. It's so good that you can tune in to our broadcasts. We're having such a rich time together. Let me welcome you on behalf of uh, the staff team, on behalf of the church, whether you're viewing from the city of Frankston, this great and beautiful city, I think one of the best places to live in Melbourne, or whether you're viewing from outside of Frankston, perhaps interstate, or even from uh, some other part of the globe, uh, we welcome you to our online broadcasts today. And don't forget to send us an email. If you are viewing from some distance, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. One of the great truths of the gospel, one of the deep truths of the gospel, is that through the life and sacrifice of Jesus, not only is our relationship with God restored as we put our trust in him, but we're made one with each other. We have a spiritual unity. We're joined spiritually to every other believer in Jesus, not only in our local church, but across this city, our nation, and the world. We are one in Christ. And as we gather virtually online, we're expressing that unity, expressing the gospel truth that Christ has made us spiritually one, even though we can't gather physically. So let me thank you for expressing your faith in that way today. Well, you'll be aware that uh, we were at this point going to be doing a series on the book of Judges, Broken Heroes, we called it, and we had that all lined up. But as I prayed at the start of social distancing uh, restrictions, I, I felt led by God to pivot from that series and to look at a series that would empower the church in her devotional life. Because, of course, in these COVID restrictions, we might have more time to be alone with God, more time uh, to devote to the devotional life. And so we've undertaken a series on the Lord's Prayer, Your Kingdom Come Jesus School of Prayer. Today we continue with our next instalment in that series and we're looking at the third request in the prayer, Your will be done on earth as in heaven. And we look forward to hearing from Reverend Renee as he shares a word with us this morning on that topic. Well, let me encourage you now to keep silence for a moment before we proceed with our opening prayer. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety, for freedom to work, leisure to rest, and for all that's beautiful in creation and human life. And in this time of social distancing and pandemic, we're especially mindful when these gifts are given to us. And above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we have a few scripture readings set aside uh, for this talk today. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Our first reading, Psalm 82. So let me encourage you to uh, perhaps uh, grab your dusty Bible from its bookshelf and even open it up today. Even if you haven't opened your Bible for a long time, let me encourage you, today's the day to open your Bible and follow along with uh, the talk. And, and so let me just give you a moment to go and grab that Bible, Psalm 82, our first scripture reading. Psalm 82, God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. 
They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. But you'll die like mere men. You'll fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God. Judge the earth. For all the nations are your inheritance. And may God add his blessing to this reading. Our second reading is Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. Matthew chapter 5. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is God's word. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you to our broadcast, and uh, it's wonderful to be with you uh, as we travel through this exploration of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer. And uh, as we've been going through it over the past four weeks, I wonder if you've noticed something a little bit unusual, something about the way Jesus prays. And it's not as though you didn't already know this thing. It's just that it's not the first thing we normally associate with prayer. I mean, practically, when we sit down to pray, when we pray in church, when we pray with others, when we pray in our life group, maybe at Grace, think about those times and ask yourself, what is prayer? And of course, we say prayer is asking for things. Prayer is bringing our hopes, our plans, our desires for health and security, our prayers for the church and for people we know and love. We ask God. To things. However, we've arrived today at the, this is the fifth week of our series on the Lord's Prayer, and we're about to cover the fourth line of the prayer, and yet we still haven't come to our requests, asking for our daily food, forgiveness of sins, asking that God would keep us from trouble and temptation. Four lines in, and we still haven't got to the asking part of the prayer. No, we're still engaged in declaring God's qualities, his fatherhood, his holiness, the power of his kingdom. And today, his good and sovereign will over the whole earth. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. The disciples ask Jesus how to pray. And the first thing he tells them, the first third of the prayer is about God, his love, his power, his character, who he is and what he's done. Now, why is this? So why does Jesus think that it's a good idea to first to, to saturate ourselves in thoughts of God before we dive into our requests that focus on the circumstances of our lives? And it, it's not just in Jesus. We actually find this same tendency in Paul's letters as well. Paul occasionally asks for practical everyday things, sure, but overwhelmingly he prays for a richer, fuller understanding of God. Here's a couple of examples. Ephesians chapter 1, he says, I keep asking that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Again, in the third chapter of Ephesians, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Why is he praying like this? Doesn't he know that they have physical needs? Doesn't he know that some of them have lost their jobs or have sick kids or are suffering with mental illness or have nowhere to live? 
course he knows this. He knows they have outward needs. But as important as that is, he's far more interested in their inner needs. He wants to see them renewed from the inside out. Here's a couple more examples. Philippians 1. He says, This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. And Colossians chapter 1, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you. For, uh, fill, fill you with, with what? With, with, with money? With food? With, with self-esteem? No. He asks God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This is how Paul constantly prayed for his friends. Such rich, encouraging prayers that get to the heart of our very selves, who we are in God, dwelling in the love that he has for us, knowing the power of his spirit, and being filled with Christ. This is how Paul, this is how Jesus encourages us to pray by immersing ourselves in God's character and purposes. Why? So that when we do pray for our everyday concerns, we ask for them in faith. In faith. Faith in who God is. See, the problem is that so often we think of prayer as a way to get God to give you Things And that's not a bad place to start. As we saw a few weeks ago, God is our Heavenly Father. He loves to hear our requests. He loves to give us good things like food and health and clothing and shelter and good relationships and love. The problem with approaching God just as the one who gives us things is that it becomes a transaction or a technique. I do this, then that happens. I pray and then I get stuff. And if I didn't get stuff, then I'm doing it wrong. I need to change up my technique. But no, prayer happens in a relationship. And when we spend time with God in prayer, when we spend time with him, bringing our concerns to him, listening to his voice, reflecting on his word in his presence, then we go deeper into our relationship with him. Our hearts become ordered around him. God becomes central once again. And so we can ask in faith. And I don't just mean faith as in believing so hard that you're going to get uh, what you asked for, but faith in who God is and what he's done for us. See, our hearts are always wandering off into unfaithfulness, into unbelief. We fall in love with different things, power, pleasure, status, safety, comfort, control, convenience. But when we look on God again and turn to him in prayer, this kind of prayer, again and again, then our hearts are brought back to him. That's why Paul prays that we would have faith. He prays that we would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we would know him better. That's why Jesus encourages us to pray for God's kingdom to come and that his will be done. So I want to take the rest of our time this morning uh, just to talk about God's will. And I'm going to do that in two ways. First, looking at our understanding of his sovereign will. And second, our submission to his revealed will. So two ways of looking at God's will, his, his, uh, his sovereign will and his revealed will. So let's look at God's sovereign will and why it's so important for us to embrace this part of who God is. He is creator and ruler of all things. Nothing happens without his knowledge and say so. Now, how will this affect our prayers? When we pray, we'll have an understanding that it's all resting in his hands. What a powerful incentive to pray knowing that God is in control overall. Nothing happens in this universe aside from his will. If you were going to ask anybody for anything, wouldn't you go straight to the one with the most power if you could? If you had access to the CEO of a company, for instance, wouldn't you ask them for a favour 
instead of the work experience kit. Uh, say if you had a problem with your mobile phone plan. I was charged too much for my data last month. I uh, shouldn't have to pay that much for just going one gig over my plan. No, that's ridiculous. I want to speak to someone about this. I want to get reimbursed. Who do you think I would rather talk to? The person on the helpline who can't do anything except remind me of the terms that I signed off on when I got on the plan? Or would I rather speak to the, C the CEO of Optus who also happened to be my favourite uncle? There's no contest. Of course I would want to speak with the CEO. I've got a direct line to his mobile and I know he'll pick up because my number's saved in his phone. Uh, he'll listen to my problem and get it sorted out for me because he cares for me and he's got the power to do it. Knowing that God has all power and control is an incentive to pray, not a discouragement. But you might think about God's sovereignty a slightly different way. You might think of it as a reason not to pray. Doesn't God know what he's going to do anyway? What influence can I have over him? His plans are marked out from eternity. What's my prayer going to do against all that? Or you might think, oh, I've tried prayer. I ask and God doesn't listen. He doesn't give me what I ask for. When things are difficult and it's hard to have faith, it's always good to look at Jesus. How did Jesus pray? Were his prayers always answered? Well, yes, they were. Now, did Jesus always get what he asked for? No, he didn't. When Jesus earnestly prayed in the garden, he was anxious. He was fearful. He was racked with agony over what was coming his way. He prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. God did not take the cup from him. Jesus went to the cross and he drank the cup of God's wrath on human disobedience, on all our unfaithfulness, on all our going against his will, and Jesus deserved none of it. And as Jesus died, he cried out, Why have you forsaken me? He was cut off so that we would never be cut off from God. Now, I didn't finish Jesus' prayer in the garden of Gethsemane the night before he died. There's a, a small bit at the end I left off. He prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And if you're anything like me, this is uh, kind of like what you add to your prayers just in case he doesn't give you the result you are after. You pray to God, if it's your will, cure my insomnia. If it's your will, Give me a quick parking space. But if it's not your will, well, I'll try not to be disappointed. But Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. He prayed that out of a deep understanding of God's character. God hears us and he always answers our prayers, but he may not do it the way we're looking for. So we may not even recognize it when the prayer is answered. And we may look around for reasons why God didn't answer our prayers the way we were hoping. But we have to realize that God's ways are above our ways. There's probably no explanation that would satisfy us because we are not God. Only God is all-powerful. Only God is all-knowing. Only God is all-loving. And so we pray, your will be done. So that's God's sovereign will. That's, that's his, his power over creation and our whole lives. Well, let's finish this morning by looking at his revealed will. When we pray, your will be done on earth, we're asking God, not just that he would exercise his sovereign will, but that he would strengthen his people. He would strengthen us to do his will. Last week, we were looking at God's kingdom coming into the world and all the different ways God is driving out the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of Satan, and making way for his own perfect rule 
among his people. And we long to be a part of that perfect, that perfected kingdom of God. We want to usher in the full reign of God with all its peace and freedom and perfection. And we want to start today. We don't want to wait until our deathbeds to start living for God. We don't want to wait until Jesus return. We want to start now. We want God's will to be done in and through our lives so that we can bring glory to him. We want to be witnesses to a watching world of the love and peace and joy that the kingdom brings. Now, how are we going? As a community of disciples, how are we going to bring, being that witness to a world that needs it? Jesus said in Matthew 5, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. So what are we doing to show that light in our families, in our life groups, in our ministry teams, in our congregations, as the church of St. Luke's, as the churches in Frankston, as the church in Australia, as the church across the whole world, as the church across time and space throughout world history, we long for God's will to be done and we pray that he would start with us, his church. What kind of reputation are we building for God as we live our lives as Jesus' apprentices? And I ask this because we are on display. Even if we think no one's really paying that much attention, they are. And the church, the people of God, have massive capacity to do good in the world. But we've got to get things in the right order. Obedience first, then impact for the world. Doing the will of God, then becoming a blessing for all nations. Which brings us back to Paul's prayers. When he, when he prayed in the pattern of Jesus, praying for our inner life, for our relationship with God first, asking that we would have knowledge and depth of insight, that we would be strengthened with power in our inner being, that we would have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father. Will you pray these things for your brothers and sisters? Now, some of us are feeling a bit cut off right now. We're, we're feeling adrift. We're, we're missing this gather, being able to gather together as God's people, worshipping together. We might feel a little useless, a little cut off from the body of Christ. Let me leave you this morning with this encouragement. This is something we can all do this week. Think of one person you know. It might be someone from St. Luke's. It might be one of our mission partners. It might be someone serving in, a, in another Christian ministry that you support but think of one person and pray one of Paul's prayers for them. Pick a, pray, a prayer from Colossians 1 or Ephesians 1 or, or Philippians 1 or whatever's easiest for you, highlighting it in your Bible, printing it out, and use that prayer to pray for that one person. Pray that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know God better that they would know the hope that God has called them to, the riches of their inheritance with all the saints. Pray that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and know that your prayers said in faith will be answered by our Father in heaven for his glory alone. Let's pray. Our Father, we long to know you more and to be filled with a deeper understanding of your grace towards us in the Lord Jesus, how he bled and died to take away our debt and bring us back into your arms. We want to know the riches of your love, which surpass knowledge. We want our love to abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And we ask so our lives would be renewed and your reputation would grow here in Frankston and all over the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Renee, for that encouraging word as we seek our great God and, and his will in our lives and in the world. And we continue now with an attitude of, of prayer. Uh, let me encourage you to adopt an attitude of prayer as, as we bring the needs of the world and the church before the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, you set the narrow bands of our circumstance that we might seek you and find the help needed for each hour. We lift up to you those struggling with overwhelming despair in these days. We pray that your truth would break into their minds and hearts, that who they are made in your image and who you are, a victorious God working out your purposes, would bring them hope. You reign on heaven's throne with all might and authority in your hands. You bend all circumstances for the good of your people. We rest in these truths today. Father, we commit to you those in our families and community seeking answers, seeking life, seeking God. And we pray that they'll find you, Father, in the face of your Son, Jesus, and be conformed into his image. Give us the good gifts we need, life and health and safety. Watch over the vulnerable, be their fortress and rock. We lift up to you, Heavenly Father, those in our church who are frontline workers in the healthcare sector or as teachers. And we pray, Lord, that you'll give them courage as they undertake their responsibilities and your protection. We pray also for a vaccine for the coronavirus that's uh, tested and available. We pray that you'll protect the vulnerable in our church from infection and all evil. Guide our nation and her leaders. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll give our Prime Minister and Premier wisdom to manage COVID restrictions, to know when and how to lift them and rebuild the economy while keeping us as safe as possible. Save us from all ill and affliction and bring us to glory. We join our prayers together with the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, we have opportunity now to share in the Lord's Supper in Holy Communion spiritually. And uh, so there's a few words for me to say to introduce that. But before we do, I'd like to share a prayer of confession. Of course, as we approach communion, it's important to recognize the meaning of what Jesus has done for us, uh, his sacrifice on the cross and uh, the forgiveness that's ours. And, and so we, we see and recognize and trust all those things as we share a prayer of confession together. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith 
pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we continue now in our time of communion. All glory and honour be yours, always and everywhere. Mighty creator, ever-living God, we give you thanks and praise for our saviour Jesus Christ, who by the power of your spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And merciful God, we thank you for these uh, gifts of your creation, this, this bread and this wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given you thanks, uh, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died, Christ is risen and Christ will come again. So we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us, and let's feed on him in our hearts by faith, giving him thanks. Amen. Renee, let me invite you to come forward. body and blood of Christ, keep me in eternal life. And I'll let Renee serve himself. The body and blood of Christ, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you that in this sacrament you assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and help us to grow in love and obedience that we may serve you in the world and finally be brought to that table where all your saints feast with you forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a few moments for uh, community news and uh, let me pick up one or two notices and then I'll pass over to Reverend Renee to conclude the notices and our time together. would like to give you an update. Uh, you'll be aware that the Premier Daniel Andrews has permitted faith communities to meet in groups of 10 or less and so that's been his uh, permission, his uh, discernment. And, uh, and so what's happening now is that the diocese has put together a set of requirements 
if churches want to take up that, that offer. And our wardens are working through those requirements so that we could move toward opening St. Luke's small-scale meetings. So that's where we're up to. So there's no meetings scheduled at the moment. Our meetings are still suspended, but the wardens and myself are working hard to put the framework together so that we could offer small-scale meetings to you, to groups, if they wanted to take that up. Uh, now, Reverend Renee has one or two notices. Well, I think congratulations are in order for all who helped out with the Hospitality Sunday event last week, and uh, particularly to Denise Hay for her Spanakopita, which uh, sounded absolutely incredible. And, of course, the cafe remains open, <clears throat> available for takeaway orders, including frozen meals. And here are the times, Tuesday and Thursday from 11 till 1, and Saturday from 9.30 to 11.30. So those are the times you can go in, uh, pick up a meal, and um, enjoy that, support the cafe. Uh, just a couple of birthdays this week. Jennifer Valentine, Valda Ballard, Ingrid Glenn, Coral Ford, and Stephanie Mitchell. A very happy birthday to you all, and I hope you find a great way to celebrate this week. Well, let me leave you with a blessing this morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless and stay safe.